preach on this morning. And of course, it's something that's real life to me that uh, that involves me, and and it's true to life. It's true to life. It's true to my own spiritual life. And uh, I think it's important to preach on things like that. Uh, I could flip anywhere in this Bible and just come up with a sermon in a few minutes. Uh, but it wouldn't be true to my life, and it probably is not true to your life, uh, unless you're in that circumstance. <clears throat> so my sermon this morning is about prayer. Uh, it came from a, a course of Mimi I seen on social media that kind of stirred my spirit and got me riled up. Uh, and, it, and it just proves how little they know, how little they know about God. And the Mimi went, went like, sort of like this. God, God already knows what you want and need, but He wants to hear you beg. And there was an image there of, of Christ laughing. Because he wants to hear you beg. It's awful. It is awful. It's the worst thing I've ever seen. They have no idea about God and how his relationship with men. They have no idea how God deals with his children. They have no idea that God has already prepared a safety net for his people. God doesn't expect us to beg, to beg him for anything. His will's already set. He's Alpha and Omega, the beginning. He already knows what's going to happen. Listen, that kind of doctrine, that Armenian doctrine, that's just cannon fodder for the atheists. They can take that and make that me, me, and make it apply, and people actually think it's true. Because you know the Armenian thinks it's all about us. It's all about our will. Our will. But Christ, if you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 6, Jesus Christ himself taught us how to pray. Very important lesson. That whole chapter is in red letters. That's his words. This is not my words. This is Christ's words. And Christ taught us how to pray. And when you read through that, you'll see there's no begging in there. No begging. So I have six, I have six points, quick points. And I'll just make them. I'll go through these as quick as possible. I know we're running behind. And I just have a few points to each of those points. The six points. Matthew chapter 6. And I'd like to thank my wife for this new giant print Bible. Nice. So I'm in a transition now struggling because I used to print my sermons so I could read them and, and not have to fumble with glasses. But she got me a giant print Bible that I can actually read now and it's working out good. Matthew chapter 6. We're going to start there in verse 9. Or Christ teaches us how to pray. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. I mean, he said, pray like this. This is how you do it. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. End of the prayer. Amen. And out of that prayer, I pick six points. Christ said, Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed, that means holy. That means consecrated. That means sacred. That means revered. 
the third commandment of the Ten Commandments is not to take the Lord's name in vain. You don't have to cuss to take the Lord's name in vain, my friend. Sure. You can take the Lord's name in vain by a flipping it prayer. Mm -hmm. That's the third commandment. And if I pause a minute, it's because I'm trying to condense. I'm, I'm trying to figure what's good to leave in and what's good to leave out. And it's hard to do that at times. But what we see is when we go to prayer, we need to recognize, we need to acknowledge that hallowed be thy name, that God is sacred, that God is holy, that God is in control. Hallowed is his name. Point number one. You don't take God's name in vain. You don't make a flippant in prayer. You don't ask God, Lord, let me win the lottery. God doesn't need the lottery to make you rich if it's according to his will. God doesn't need the lottery to put bread on your table. And you don't need to be rich for him to supply that. <coughs> Point number two. Thy will be done. Listen, that means you're acknowledging the will of God. And to, as the Old Testament Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. If that storm comes through here and comes right through here and wipes this property clean, I'll trust him. Amen. Because it happens. Because it's His will. And people don't understand that everything that happens is God's will. Joe Biden is the president because it's God's will. <coughs> we need to acknowledge that in our prayer. Thy will be done. Not my will, but your will. As on earth as it is in heaven. You also need to understand that God has a permissive will. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and this is a very simplistic way of putting it. But I used to watch the show Price is Right on television. I don't watch television much anymore. But I used to watch the show The Price is Right. And there was this game they play called Plinko. I don't know if any of you ever saw that. Mm -hmm. That may be before your time. But they dropped a little thing in. There's a whole board of nails. And the little thing goes all around in there. Listen, that's a simple way to look at God's will. It may go this way or that way, but you're still in the game. You're still in, you can't escape it. That's right. <laughs> and your destiny's there. It's going to hit the bottom somewhere. It's going to go in one of those holes. People think they can control it this way or that way. Listen. <laughs> it's, all, it's, it's all in God's will it's all in God's plan we can't control it and that's the importance of prayer when you acknowledge thy will be done not my will and God may per per permit you to go this way instead of that way in his will in there you're not out of the game you're in the game There's a couple holes at the bottom. One's prizes, a million dollars. None. Lose it. And on occasion, on very, very slim occasion, that little plinko will get hung up in there. It will stop. It's hung. And somebody's got to touch it to make it go one way or the other. And when you, in your prayer life, God will touch that thing and make you go this way instead of that way and keep you from temptation and keep you from evil. Within His will. So when we pray, we need to be in agreement with God's will. God, if I win the lottery, $10 million... I'll give it all to you. I'll take care of everybody I can. 
And if I don't win the lottery, I'm going to be happy just the same. In your will. Yeah. I don't think God uses the lottery whatsoever. He's not concerned whatsoever. He, he owns the cow, cattle on a thousand hills, and he owns the hills too. People, people pray all the time for things they don't need. They complain to God. Oh God, if I just had a Cadillac, I'd be happy. If I just had a big fine house on the beach, it would, uh, my life would be good. I don't even think God hears that mess. I really don't. It's, imagine, put yourself in his shoes, the clutter of prayers that are amiss that he has to listen to. That's my second point. Are you in agreement in your prayer with God's will? Are you to the place where you say, whatsoever comes, Lord, I love you anyway. I trust you anyway. That's a hard thing. That's a hard thing, especially concerning death. I, I always go out to the cemetery before church and visit my loved ones out there and my friends. But it's God's will. Point number three. Give us this day our daily bread. And uh, the atheists think that's a begging statement. But Philippians 4.19 says, But God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. So now unto God and our Father be glory for whatever and ever. Yeah, people, they say, oh, that's begging. But uh, huh. Psalms 37, 25 says, I have been young and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. God's going to feed you. God promised to feed his children. He's never seen the righteous begging for bread. And if you have to beg for food, you might need to uh, -look, look at your relationship with God. You might need to check it out. There's times I, I had to eat beans and rice just to survive. But I always had some beans and rice. There was always something in the cabinet to fill my belly. God supplied all my needs according to His riches and glory, according to His will. According to his word. That doesn't mean there won't be tough times or slack times. There may be times you have to eat cornbread. But the cornbread will be there. God will supply it. Never have to beg for bread. It's like the children of Israel out there in the wilderness longing for the onions and the garlics and the leeks of, of Egypt when God was supplying the manna and quail from heaven. Quail's a good meal. If you've never had it, it's good. I could eat it every day. Quail and bread, and I would survive. God would supply it. I love that in the Psalms that, that God's seed never going to beg for bread. The Bible says take no thought of what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear 
or where you're going to sleep. Take no thought of tomorrow because God already promised to supply those things that you're in need of. And that's why we pray, give us this day our daily bread. It's not a begging. It's a confirmation of His promise. church's job to feed the community. Now, I've given a lot of thought about that. I've given a lot of thought. Some people, God may have called some people to do that, to feed those people that are out there hungry. And if you know somebody that's hungry, it's your duty to feed them. And if you can't feed them, it's your duty to come to the church and say, look, these people are hungry. These people need some help. And then it'll become the church's duty to step in and help that situation. I, I, I by no means meant to ignore people that are hungry. It doesn't work that way. God puts those things in your life, those things in your life, as a test to do what's right or to do what's wrong. So I hope that clears some, some things up about that. Point number four is about forgiveness. Forgive us our debts, the Bible says, as we forgive our debtors. Oh, that's hard to do. It's hard to forgive somebody that's done you wrong or that you perceive done you wrong. Somebody owes you a pile of money and you ain't got your money in no two years. Kind of kind of aggravates you. Kind of makes you want to hate that person. Kind of makes you want to want some vengeance. When all you simply have to do is forgive it. Is forgive that debt. A lot of God's forgiveness is based on how we forgive. If we don't forgive, we expect God to forgive us. It's like, it's like wanting your cake and eating it too. Dearly beloved, the Bible says, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath. That means put that hate aside that vengeance aside for it is written vengeance is mine I will repay saith the Lord I was in a situation several years ago where a person I perceived done me wrong and I let that hate and that wrath build and there was no forgiveness in me and I set out to destroy that person. I was going to get my vengeance. Today I'm thanking God that none of my things came to fruition. That I didn't destroy somebody's life. That I kept, that God got me to the place where I could let it go and turn it over to Him. Because I had, had I done that, that would have been on my account. And every aspect of it, everything that surrounded it, would have been on my account too. Other people that were hurt. Innocent people. And I seldom do this, but I got down on my knees in my closet and I thank God that my vengeance was useless. God said, no, we're not doing it this way, and your righteousness was wrong. My righteousness was not right. He's the judge. He's the final judge. He will either avenge or not, according to the truth, according to true righteousness. 
Because when you're full of hate, you, you, your righteousness is askew. It's not on mark. It's not on target. You don't know what's right and what's wrong. Hate blinds you. And it'll, it'll hang you up in that Plinko game and you can't move. So I thank God I didn't destroy somebody's life even though I was man. And and I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to stand at the judgment seat of Christ too and answer for that. What I wanted done. Where God said, no, we're not doing it that. We're not doing it your way. And I found out true righteousness of God, if you let that go, if you do that forgiveness, God will judge it righteously. He will give the reward. He will give the, the answer to whoever that person is and whatever they did. It's not our job for that mention stuff. So point four says, forgive us our debts. as we forgive our debtors. So, I did some forgiveness, and now I've got some forgiveness in return. Isn't that amazing how that works? God says it's better to be defrauded than to, than to pursue that avenue of hate and vengeance. And that's why we pass how we should pray. God, help me forgive others like you forgave me. I could say more about that but for the sake of time because that really, that's really a deep subject right there. I, I can't even scratch the surface on it. Point number five. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. That's talking about God's permissive will right there. <clears throat> God will permit you to go left. God will permit you to go right. But in the end, you're going down. Doesn't change anything. Whether you choose to go this or you choose to go that, you're still in that game. You're still in God's will. And prayer can determine which side you go on within God's will. It can determine whether you eat tomorrow or not, your prayer. Or what you eat. Your prayer, your prayer can determine what you drive, how much money you have, just by simply acknowledging that God is the final will. It's God's will that controls it all. That you're still going down. You're still going to end up where God wanted you. We're blinking around here. And that prayer decides how many nails you're going to hit on the way down to get your, where you're going. Corinthians 10 13 says there hath no temptation taking you but that which is common to men and temptation is common to everyone everybody has it God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able you've talked about some importance in prayer that fourth point about lead us not into temptation I pray every day, God, take that temptation out of my path. I don't want to hit that nail. But God's faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted that above that what you were able. 
and it goes further. But with the temptation, also make a way to escape it. When it comes, you can say, I'm going to dodge that one. Because God permissive will allow it. Because I'm a servant of God, I'm not going to hit that nail. And not only will you escape it, you'll be able to bear it. It's that thing you wanted so bad, that temptation that you, all you have to do is reach there and, and grab it and touch it. And you got it. That's in God's permissive will. You, you can grab it. You can fall to it. Don't think you're immune. There is no vaccine. But in prayer, you can say, oh, no. And when you say no, God's going to give you the strength to bear it. Make a way to overcome it. Christ was tempted just like us. Probably with many things, with on many aspects. Exactly the same way. He was full man and full God. He experienced everything in life that we do. That's why he's a sufficient Savior. But he never fell to it. The devil himself took him up to a wilderness and tempted him for three days. I'm going to give you all this power. I'm going to give you all this money. I'm going to give you all these kingdoms. Everything on earth I'm going to give to you. And all Christ said was I gave him the word of God. <laughs> Thus saith the Lord. What do we do when we're tempted? You better pray. That's not a beg. That's a safeguard. Most people will pray they don't they're not even acknowledging God. They're, 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 they're praying to some sky person, whoever it might, they don't know God. They don't know their Savior was tempted the way you are and that he overcame it and you didn't. I thank God I pray that he gives me a way to overcome temptation. James says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diver temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, ask God. that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, not wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave in the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not a man think he shall receive anything of the Lord, because a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. That's what the Word of God says. That's talking about prayer, about asking God. The only thing it says there is to ask God for wisdom. Ask God for wisdom that you may know right from wrong, left from right, how to overcome temptation. Does that lead to evil? And that's, the, that's where temptation leads is to evil. I'm 
believe that's a verse out of Corinthians there. But again, I think this is Paul ending a prayer. <laughs> the kingdom, the, the glory forever is an acknowledgement. The main thing about prayer is acknowledging that God's the answer. God's in control. I pray before God, make me rich, and I'll do, I'll do anything you want. I fell to that begging God. Uh, but God gave me wisdom to show me help. That, that's not the right way. That's wrong. That's not my will. You can be happy and have everything you need according to my will without being rich. So I'm not rich. I'm in God's will. He doesn't need the lottery to make me rich. I'm rich indeed. It's sort of like the, the, the great reset, you know. They say, you're going to own nothing and be happy? <laughs> you can't get that anywhere but through Christ. Right. <laughs> Only Christ can make you own nothing and be happy. Klaus Schwab can't do it. Listen, James went on to talk about some prayer. He said, you lust and you have not, you kill, you desire to have and cannot attain. You fight and you war, yet you have not. Because you ask not, or you ask wrong. Ye ask and receive not, because you ask amiss. You're not asking the right way for the right things. Because you want to consume it upon your lust. You want to be rich so you can have a yacht and spend the day fishing all the time. Not because you want to go out there and feed some hungry folks. You want to be rich so you can drive a flying car and everybody that sees you pass, they go, look at him, how envious I am of him. I want to be like that. You can't serve two masters. You can't serve God and money. Hardly is a rich man going to heaven. You know, but through prayer, all things are possible through God. There's going to be some rich folks in heaven that's going to say, I, I did so many wrong things with, with everything God supplied for me. I could have did this and I didn't do that. I went left in the game and I should have went right. Because I wanted to consume it upon my own lust. It's the truth. It's true. Yeah, I'd like to have a fine big boat with all the fishing equipment. God may supply that for me one day. It may be in His will. It may be in His will that I'm going to have millions of dollars and without even playing the lottery. I don't play the lottery, by the way. It's gambling. Yeah. 99.9% .9 of prayers is prayers that you could for consuming your own lust. And God ain't having it. Because you're not acknowledging He's in control. You're not acknowledging that His will reigns, that His will is supreme, that His will is perfect.
That means even after eternity, it's still God's. If this world disappears, if all this is gone, God still has the kingdom. God still has the power. God still has the glory. Everything he does with us, everything that happens on this earth, is for his glory. It's because of his power. It's his kingdom. Whether you go left or right, it's still his. Yeah, in Philippians, another prayer that in it, Now unto our God, our Father, be glory forever and ever, ever and ever. It's, it's them Old Testament prophets and the New Testament saints always ended their prayers with, Thy is sure, God. It all belongs to you, even my life. And I acknowledge that. And I pray. And I let the point out that was important that <clears throat> I thank you for it, God. I thank God for the good, the bad, the ugly. It's given me a lot of wisdom. And I'm getting old. And in my old age, I've never seen God's children begging for bread. There's one prayer, and it lets us talk about this. It's in closing. I got two more little points here, and this is my closing. Romans chapter 8, verse 26, and we're going to we'll get some real prayer here. Let's talk about the real, the real prayer. And it's not an everyday prayer. It doesn't happen every day in your life. You know, I get up in the mornings, I'm talking to God. I'm out there working on the deck, I'm talking to God. I try to walk with God everywhere I go, every minute of the day. And as I'm going along, I'm thanking him for this, that, and the other. But Romans chapter 8, verse 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for. God says you don't know what you need to pray for. When you're praying, you're praying the myth. You're asking for the wrong things. We don't know what we should pray for. But there comes a time you do know. We know what, not what we should pray for as we ought to. You ought to know what you need to pray for. We, we, every Sunday morning we have a prayer list up here. And, and everything that's on there is due to some infirmities that people suffer. Mm -hmm. That's intercession prayer. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. When, it, when, it, when it's important, when it's true, you can't even speak. God already knows what it is. The Spirit of God makes intercession for us. If you've never been to that place in life, it's coming. I know several people here have lost loved ones. That's a good place to find that kind of prayer where it's, you know, I can't, God, I can't do anything about this. And your spirit's groaning. And God's hearing it. And he makes intercession for it. And every time that's happened to me, God moves. God did something about it. Even in death, God, when people were dying, God did something about it.
God's will that people die, but a prayer can sure change how they die and how it affects them and how it affects the people around them. There is a good death, you know. You can die well. I believe with all my heart, Brother Reggie died well. I have no doubt in my mind about Brother Reggie. And your prayer can affect things like that. <clears throat> Both of my brothers died. I don't know that either of them, I was with one when he died and I was not with the other one. Sometimes, sometimes God uses us to, just to help people let go. Just to help people have the faith to know that something else is coming. There's another place after this. I was with my brother Eugene when he died. I said, me and my brother Mark had set up with him until like 2.30 in the morning. And Dodie came in to take her turn, you know. And uh, I was hard in prayer right before I laid down and went to sleep. That God needed to change this situation, this terrible situation. He suffered so bad. I know it's hard. And I just laid my head on the pillow and Dodie came in and said, God's taken him. God's will was done. You can't always be with them when, when they go. But you can, you can acknowledge God's will in it. We all ate the fruit, you know. And the consequences was that you will surely die. And ever since then, everybody dies. <clears throat> the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And He searcheth the hearts and knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. Because He maketh intercession for the saints. <laughs> According to God's will. Even that doesn't go outside of God's will. Yeah. Listen, the Bible says Christ is a friend that sticks as close as to a brother. Closer than a brother. Closer than I could ever be with my brothers. It's nice to have a friend like that. It's nice that you can walk through your day holding God's hand in conversation with Him about every aspect of life. About your temptations. About your food. About His will. He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And the only person I know that's closer than a brother would be a father. The safest I ever felt in my life is when I was holding my dad's hand as a little child. Never felt more safer in my life when my dad was around. He's gone as well. He died young, according to God's will. But we can, we can hold the Father's hand. We can go to the Father in prayer. We can talk to Him about anything. Anything, including our temptations and our sin. You better be talking to God about your sin. You better be talking to Him about it. But it's all according to the will of God. said, I never felt more safe around my father. I was always secure. I also felt safe around my brother growing up. They took care of me. They let no harm come but Craig. 
I remember a little boy trying to beat me up in grade school. <laughs> and my brothers took care of that matter. <laughs> Quick. That boy got snow rubbed in his face. <laughs> that was in Alaska, by the way. You got to look at God as being your father. If you're not looking at God as being the total protector of your life, you're not looking at it right. You got to look at your hand holding God's hand, and feed that. Then that feeling of safety and security comes. We live in a day that there's no, or natural affection's gone. I can't see a man letting his children go without food or clothes, or a mother having an abortion. It, that's lacking natural affection. It's gone. It's, it's in our society. It's a prevailing thing. You see it every day on the news. Every day. But our Father takes care of us. He's promised us that He's going to supply all our needs according to His riches and glory. And He owns it all. Everything. So I'm going to Last statement. And we're going to come to the end. I've I, I encapsulated the Lord's Prayer. That's what they call it, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Jesus Christ himself prayed it. And it's a complete submission to God's will. That's what it is. Every point in it is submitting to God's will. What else do you need? And with that, I appreciate your attention. Thank you.